everybody. Welcome to today's Global Soul Gathering. Hmm. As we begin, let us just take a moment and allow ourselves to fully be just here. And as a way of grounding our energy, opening our hearts, relaxing our minds, I want to open with a meditative inquiry. One, that you just follow the sound and energy coming through my voice as it guides you into a deeper state of heartfelt surrender. And oftentimes when we do inquiry, it is the sacred contemplation and exploration of what if. And so let's explore what if together, whether your eyes wanna be open or closed. Simply consider these words that don't necessarily have an answer, but just deliver your consciousness deeper into a reality of total living embodiment. Allow the breath to come and go as it wishes to come and go. Allowing the body to be however the body wishes to be. Allowing the mind to be as it wishes to be. Allowing the environment around you to be as it is. And from this space, we contemplate the following questions. That offer renewal, perspective, where are you? And the changes you feel are the only answers in existence. What if there was no one to be? Nowhere to go. and nothing to do. But to be in open space, where love pours through. What if there was no one to be? Nowhere to go. And nothing to do. But to be an open space Our 
our love pours through. And as we're just sitting quietly, peacefully, we'll take each one step by step. What if there was no one to be? No hypervigilant self working hard to erase your past. No anxious attachment towards a future you've been working hard to prepare for. No need to look around and take inventory as to who is noticing the things that only perhaps you were designed to see in you. What if there was no one to be? And how much easier would it be to see that the reflections others provide you are often just evidence of where someone is in their journey. Or as I've said before, the one who speaks may be the only one they are speaking about. even when the finger of judgment points in your direction. And what if when there's no one to be, You don't anxiously gather other people's feedback as if they are pieces to the puzzle you are missing that you must quickly assemble. So to make sure everyone sees the sides of you that gains the most approval and minimizes the threat of rejection. What if there was no one to be? And what if anyone you are being is just an innocent, beautiful play within yourself? And while there's nothing wrong with being someone. In order to be the most aligned, embodied someone that manifests the light of the universe into individuated form. You must also know the joy and liberation and ecstasy that arises when there's no one to be.
That way being someone is optional, not a necessity. Arising from freedom instead of imprisonment. All of which are gifts given to you when you simply ask. What if there's no one to be? And even when these questions and process brings up anxiousness, agitation, tension, it is only illuminating various subtle hiding spots that brings our human conditioning out of hiding to be processed and alchemized into greater vibrations of light. a process we were born to hold space for. That doesn't require us to always feel one way over another. When needing something to be one way or over another all the time, It's a telltale sign that we, were, we are lost in the identity of someone. Instead of embracing the joy of being someone. And so we gain wisdom, strength and space. from the density of identity by asking. What if there is no one to be? just like a delicious meal requires space from eating to properly digest and savor what you've consumed. If there isn't spaciousness within your identity or moments of space from your identity, there's no way to digest and assimilate the light, truth, and consciousness you are embodying. Which takes us to the next question. What if there was nowhere to go? What if there is no past to revisit? No future to anticipate. And even if you would say, well, there's only this moment, suggesting that to the innocence of ego subtly employs your ego to have the job of keeping you in this place as if there's somewhere else to be. But if there is only this moment, why would you and how could you work hard to stay there?
for through the sophistication of our conditioning, even when there's only one place to be, the ego can still figure out a way to make it its job to try to control and micromanage it. For in the beginning stages of a spiritual journey, becoming and staying present can be a wonderful aspiration for one with a very short attention span. And we find that by lengthening the attention span, one's nervous system begins to regulate. And that is an important step. But what happens when we take the next step beyond? What if there's nowhere to go? No better place I'm supposed to live. As long as I'm surrounded by safety with the ability to care for myself and nourish myself. For when we are in the unraveling of the ego and we are in the process of emptying out the layers of hunger that act as the building blocks of ego identity. We often crave going somewhere, moving somewhere, some form of environmental reinvention where the contrast between where you are and some new place creates a spot for the remaining aspects of ego to hide. And we're not doing this maliciously to pull the ego out of hiding. We're operating from a place of loving grace, inviting the ego out of hiding by not giving it a hiding spot. Not because it's meant to face a death but because the death the ego perceives is the beauty of its destiny. And so may we assist in the process by asking, what if there's nowhere to go? Because there can be some very sophisticated and subtle operating systems where even where you don't know where to go, The energy in you is like an engine idling. The emergency brake is still on, but it's ready to go at any moment. And it's not fully settled. And so we turn the engine off. We take the key out of the ignition. Place it in the cup holder. and ask. What if there is nowhere to go? And that always brings up a fundamental question that the question itself represents a deeper surrender of ego. You know your ego is surrendering throughout your life or within this moment right now. When you have the thought, so what do I do? If there's no one to be and nowhere to go, what do I do? Which is why the next question in this inquiry
What if there was nothing to do? And I give you a moment to just feel into that. while also sharing with you the plot twist. Initially, you'll hear that question, what if there's nothing to do? And most people will contract in their chair as if the ego hears that instruction and then makes it its responsibility to actively do nothing afraid that if something were to happen, it would fail the instructions of do nothing. But there's a plot twist and even deeper insights. Think of the sentence, nothing to do. On a surface level, it does mean do nothing. Because in the beginning stages of a spiritual journey, it is the practice of stillness that rejuvenates your energy field, replenishes your spirit, nourishes your heart, relaxes your mind, and regulates your nervous system. So yes, in the beginning, like a good meditation, there are moments to do nothing, to balance out the doing that may exhaust your life. But today we're taking things deeper. What if there was nothing to do? which really means may all of your doing arise from the no thingness of your deepest true nature. And even you may ask, what does that mean? How do I do from the nothingness within me? It simply means we act without agenda or an attachment to outcome. We let doing come from a space of inspiration. Just like the difference between feeding your body when inspired by visceral physical hunger versus using overconsumption to bury the emotional hunger that we may have hoped that others would fulfill in us. Or perhaps it's the resentment of having fed someone else's emotional hunger and not felt the same energy reciprocated. What is it like to do from a space of no agenda? No attachment. To choose freely from a space of inspiration and not from a belief of if I do this, I'll get that. And if I do this, I can avoid that. That's what we're ending. So when I say, what if there's nothing to do? I don't mean just sit there and hold your breath and watch life pass by. 
I mean to allow the doing. To arise from the no thing, the no agenda, the no attachment that is already awake within you. The light is already awake within you. It is a space in which all beings, all someones come and go. And yet it in of itself is no one in particular. So when you are being the light, you are both expressing your radiance through the play of someone or somebody, but it is being witnessed and experienced by a light within you that is no one in particular. So when I say, what is it? What if there's no one to be? What I'm pointing to is the light. As the no one that is being, however you appear. And because of the light is the space through which all forms manifest, as well as the energy allowing all forms to grow and evolve within it. Because all directions cannot take you closer to a light when all directions exist simultaneously within the light. It is the light that is the nowhere to go. It is the light that you already are, that you're simply on this spiritual journey, receiving instructions, insights, and healings to get into closer, more intimate communion with. You are the light, but the question that each of us answer through the choices we make, the perceptions we have, the words we speak, and the behavior we express is how deeply do you know the light within you? How deeply do you know the light that is the no one to be, the nowhere to go, and the nothing to do? the more you become aware of the light within you. The more perspective and understanding you will have and receive. 
And yet today's teaching is called the highest understanding. And since the light is the only thing that is no thing, but is still something to understand, the highest understanding could only be the process and beauty of embodiment. A light that allows all that it knows to simply be expressed through how it behaves. And when the behavior of one is a clear manifestation of the light within them, the words they speak become a healing transmission that like a force of loving gravity pulls one deeper into communion with the light they are, but may not have come to know as themselves. And as we began with an inquiry with the simple questions, what if there's no one to be, nowhere to go and nothing to do? The ego will hear those words and think I'm saying that's how you should live your life in every moment. But that's just the innocence of our conditioning, trying to impersonate that which you already are. And so it is fundamentally important to give such exquisitely clear instructions so to give the ego permission to rest so that you have all the space to get to know the light within you. And of course, as you get to know the light within you, you begin to respect the ego as a manifestation of light. even when it doesn't or rarely acts from an enlightened standpoint. And that's okay. Because the highest understanding is the embodiment of light. The embodiment of light is the holy matrimony that marries the wisdom of mind into oneness with the love of the heart. And as today's process helps you merge the wisdom of mind into the love of your heart, as these two seemingly separate but interconnected aspects come together as the wisdom of mind merges with the love of the heart. Through the power of alchemy, we create something new called loving wisdom. Loving wisdom is a wisdom always rooted in the conduct of love. Never so wise or righteous as to forget that the nature of our behavior is how we model the vibration of our embodied consciousness 
and how we transmit the virtue of integrity and the energy of loving resolve for all who suffer and are still making their way into the light. And this is a fundamental importance because in current times on a spiritual journey, it is quite common for one that overflows with wisdom, who has consumed much wisdom, who seeks additional wisdom. To have such a righteous attachment with the wisdom they've gained that it somehow gives their ego unconscious permission to treat others they judge as knowing less than from a space of judgment, indecency, and cruelty. But that is not the way. If we are to be wise, we are to be the embodiment of loving wisdom. And if there is a wisdom we have within us that doesn't allow us to be soft, open, gentle, and surrendered, it may not be the deepest or highest truth that you're seeking. Let it be known. And from the perspective of enlightenment, often depicted between an evolving student and a master teacher. The student will come to the teacher and say, Master, I had another realization. And the master will say, what did you realize? And the student will share their wisdom. Imagine the student says, I realized all is one. And the master smiles and says, untrue. And the student so perplexed says, Master, you've taught all as one. How could that be untrue? And the master says, it's untrue because the words you are speaking right now is not the actual state you're speaking from. because embodiment is the highest understanding. And imagine that student stomps off frustrated. And the master, days later, sees the student. And the master says, so what have you realized now? And the student says, I don't know, I've just been feeding people. And the master bows in the presence of embodiment as the highest understanding. Equally so, loving wisdom can have another imbalance where our love comes from a place of codependency, enmeshment, overgiving, self-sabotage. Inner neglect, mirroring the abandonment and invisibility we may have felt in our families or our earlier experiences where we overgive and only perceive equal treatment when someone else is willing 
to overgive and deplete themselves to the way in which we deplete ourselves with others. Or perhaps you've had an experience of giving and giving and giving, and then when it's time for reciprocation, someone says, thank you, or even without a thank you, and they're moving on, and we feel abandoned. We feel used. And we can even project it as I need to create boundaries against that person, when really, boundaries are for ourselves. Boundaries are so that we give from a place of wisdom and not from a state of exhaustion. Knowing that if we can't give what others need when we are exhausted, we often are too afraid of rejection and abandonment. And so that we give more than we have, only to wind up in the same place we feared if we were just honest. But in order to love from that wise place, Love must be anchored in wisdom. Just as much as wisdom must be anchored in love so that it can be wise, embodied, and not righteous or entitled. And so in today's transmission that I'm calling the highest understanding, the process of embodying your light as a manifestation of loving wisdom. We are dissolving all barriers of separation. For in a mind that is brimming with wisdom, it is likely equally as hungry whose insatiable hunger has only been created by the division and space it feels being apart from its beloved, a beloved known as your loving heart. Just as your loving heart can equally be needy, inferior, doubtful, and insecure when all of those hurtful desperate qualities is because the loving heart yearns to be reunited with its beloved, known as the wise mind. With the only reason why separation ever occurs in your reality was so that you could start your journey feeling so separate from all parts of yourself on a journey only destined to give you the opportunity through the gift of time to slowly watch all the magic of your wholeness come back together. Allowing the wise mind and the loving heart to meet in the intersecting midpoint. Known as the miracle of you. As the embodiment, translator and transmitter of loving wisdom. Where wisdom are the words emanating out of the electricity of our most noble behavior. Where behavior is the demonstration of our highest wisdom and nobility in action. with the discernment to see when you aren't able to be loving with your wisdom or when your love is not coming from the wisest secure space within you. That is when you pause your life 
and any moment you're in. Take solace and privacy to hold space for what is ready to be healed, felt and acknowledged in you. And even in the presence of someone who will interpret your need for your own personal space as another abandoner or rejecter along their life's journey. We politely allow anyone to be as they are and to say, I understand how you feel, but I can only serve you when at my best. And right now, I need to find that for me. This is why the highest understanding of embodiment will always ask you, after every morsel of wisdom that you receive, whether from a book you read, a download you receive, something you spontaneously realized, or a meme you see on social media, the highest understanding of loving wisdom will say, my beloved, now that this is known, now that you know more than you did even a moment ago, how will it change your behavior? Will you allow it to make you less resonant and less attracted to toxicity, self-destruction, and addiction? Will you allow it to help you become more attracted to nobility, integrity, and honor? Not just in the ways you conduct yourself in the presence of others, but how you treat yourself. through the actions you embody and the choices you make. Because we are far beyond a time when we can just say wise statements, worthy, of being printed on bumper stickers. It is now time for us to speak the wisdom only from the space we authentically embody. which means being honest about where we're at in our journey. Sharing of our emotional experiences. So to dissolve the tendency of filtering our words and positioning our phrases for only how it will cause other people to see us. We are in the midst of an ascension. And this specific stage, I will now name as the era of authenticity. Where we dare to share only what is authentically true right now. We're in the highest understanding of loving wisdom. We may not spend so much time trying to get others to understand 
us. Begging and hoping for external approval. For through the embodiment of loving wisdom, we actually take time to understand the experiences others are having, which may also include the experiences others are having of us. Not to agree or disagree, not to change anyone's viewpoint, so to make us feel more valued and worthy, but to take the time to understand the experiences other people are having. Because if you knew how little space other people have in their consciousness while enduring the very healing journey you are surviving, You would never place the value of your validation and approval in the hands of someone steeped in suffering. Knowing through the embodiment of loving wisdom, the only way to resolve your suffering is to become the validator and approver of self. that no one else but you can see and value. Sometimes when we're just coming from the division of wisdom that is not rooted in love, we tend to look at other people's behavior and attempt to define and diagnose what's wrong with them. And it so easily becomes a very sophisticated form of judgment. Where someone not meeting the criteria of your anticipated desires becomes the next narcissist to label. And there are narcissists in this world. There are self-centered people in this world. There is cruelty in this world. But the embodiment of loving wisdom, the highest understanding will ask you, does that label free you of despair, even the pain they may have caused? And does that help free them of the conditioning therein? And it does not. But what does simultaneously heal you of your suffering and energetically radiate a light to free others of their conditioning is when the highest understanding of loving wisdom instead has you ask what must they have gone through in their life and what must they be currently enduring in order to behave or treat me this way? And it doesn't mean we stay as someone's emotional doormat. For many of us have had it modeled to us by our families. The depiction of unhappy people too afraid to make a bold move from a place of fierce loving wisdom, either from being too attached to the relationship, afraid of being alone, afraid that that's the only relationship they'll ever have, the fear I'm gonna break up a family and cause more pain to children, even though the worst pain we can cause children is modeling unconscious toxic behavior. And so people just stay stuck where they don't actually have to be and just resent and judge 
those they can't be away from. So loving wisdom is never a matter of staying in toxicity as a form of acceptance. Instead, acceptance from a space of loving wisdom says, what must this person have gone through, survived, and be currently enduring to treat me this way? And I will contemplate that question after I remove myself from volatility, toxicity, and abuse. So to have perspective in a space of safety. So to model to everyone in my life what the empowerment and embodiment of loving wisdom looks like. When we lead with loving wisdom, we first dare to understand others. Instead of anxiously begging to be understood. Because although we all share the same space of reality, we are all living in our own parallel dimensions and timelines of this moment. Each and every one of us inhabiting our own version of Earth, to which the way you present yourself, think about yourself, and the things you know about yourself is only true in your reality of perception. Which is why when others don't validate or approve of you the way you wish to, it is simply because you are in the same space they are. But they don't live where you do. You're in your own parallel dimension. A dimension in where we all are having our own unique journeys and experiences where we're all learning the same wisdom perhaps shuffled in a different order. Have you ever realized that? That we're all learning the same wisdom as if the wisdom we're learning from A to Z or different chapters of wisdom. But to every individual, those different insights are shuffled in a different order. All of us are destined to learn it all and to be it all in fully actualized form. But we're all learning it through different circumstances and in in a different order. And yet the emotions and the experiences we have are universal. And through the interconnection of unity consciousness, the greatest way to make it safe for someone else to step out of their timeline and into your earth to understand the uniqueness of you is by you daring to understand another first. Because only when you dare to understand another first Will you come to know how little most people have to give, especially at a time like this? Where the one who is so eager to find the one to be received must receive themselves in wholeness and solidarity. And from that shift of loving wisdom, getting to know other people, their uniqueness, their strengths, their weaknesses, their journeys, their desires, their regrets. Maybe different circumstances than you, in bodies of different ethnicities and skin colors as you, throughout different cultural or sexual orientations as you. But the feelings felt and the transformations endured mirror 
all that you've come to be and continue to embody. What must someone have endured and continue to feel in order to be this way? It's not a justification to be abused. But it's an opportunity for while you find safety, often taking space away from those who only know how to reenact their trauma by taking it out on others. We take space from that volatility without being manipulated by someone else's unconsciousness. So to face the universal, the universal nature of their journey as a way of getting to know yours on a deeper level. For when you understand before needing to be understood. You are giving someone the opportunity to experience the real you and they will walk away having encountered the embodiment of light. Having received in your presence, even if just seeds planted for the future, the highest understanding, bringing the mind and heart together as one, as the embodiment of loving wisdom. When the division between mind and heart is still active, other people's discord manipulates you into acting less than loving wisdom, whether justified as retaliation or just mirroring back what someone has projected towards you. But when the mind and the heart are merged together, other people's unsavory behavior is showing you how steeped in suffering they are, how much space they don't know how to give themselves. Unaware of the self-care they need while living in a life embroiled in unconscious doing and overgiving. To which we do not respond to their vibration with the same frequency. We are simply there to be the mirrors of what their journey is revealing in them. Daring to understand before we are understood, creating boundaries so that someone else's exhaustive way of being doesn't need to exhaust us into overgiving and to simply be the loving wisdom that only the light within you knows how to convey. No matter how desperately or how hard your ego innocently tries to impersonate. Practice and get all the dance moves right. Remember the wisdom is not true because of words. The wisdom is only true when the words you speak come from the truth of what you're embodying. And if at any moment you find yourself spiraling 
and not know how to make your way back to this depth of surrender. You simply return to the invitation I offered at the beginning, which I didn't know I was gonna make into a rhyme. But you just stop where you're at, take a breath and ask yourself, what if there's no one to be? Nowhere to go. And nothing to do. But to be the space. That love pours through. And just feel right back to the love and wisdom always within you. Remember, it's not you trying to become loving wisdom. It's removing the layers that obscure the loving wisdom always alive within. This isn't about making your ego more wise, training your ego to be more loving. That would just be another impersonation through which enlightenment says, nice performance untrue. So this is not about you trying to be wiser. This is not about you trying to be loving. This is about removing the doubts, the despair, and the density of your deepest insurmountable pain by facing it. So to strip away all of what is minimizing diminishing and obscuring the beauty of loving wisdom. That I see and honor in you. Notice the difference between the purity of loving wisdom that I'm calling the highest understanding and the slipperiness of the spiritual ego. And I'll give you an example. Let's say you encountered someone, maybe sitting next to him on the plane. I only give this example because I dream of getting back on a plane and touring and doing the things that I love doing when it's, when it's time to do that. Now, some of, my, some of my most intriguing dialogues have been with people I meet on planes. So imagine you're sitting next to someone on a plane. And you start talking about your lives. And they say something like, I'm just so unhappy with my life. And only when I create enough abundance, find my perfect partner, or discover my life purpose, will I finally be free. Now, if you're operating from a spiritual ego, you will hear that and it will be a field day. As if you are a master who has just found your newest student and you will then become unsolicited life coach. 
or uninvited life coach and start correcting. Not realizing that correcting is how we meet people's doubts with invalidation. And then we get into an argument with people about what is true. And one person has their spiritual school of thought, another one has theirs. And now both people are helping both of them maintain the conflict of their past in present moment time as a debate of spiritual ideology. Where the only outcome will be both leaving exhausted. And so the question remains, how would loving wisdom respond to that? And I think you might be surprised. Imagine you sitting there next to someone and they say, I'm just so unhappy. And until I manifest more abundance, find my life partner and discover my life purpose, I cannot be free. Loving wisdom smiles and says, may you find that abundance, that life partner, and that life purpose now. I bless you with that. Knowing the journey that whether they find those things or not is going to take them on their own evolutionary adventure to be freed from the very attachments that they think and they require in order to be happy, whole, and free. The spiritual ego is a rescuer. And on the surface, it wants to free someone of despair, but it wants to free someone of despair only with the wisdom it thinks is helpful and true. And the problem with that is that it then requires one to understand you instead of you having a greater understanding of them. And so a spiritual ego would hear what a master would say and say, you're setting them into the lion's den. You're not educating them. Now what I'm doing is supporting their path. Someone just said, I will not be happy and free until I manifest more abundance, attract my perfect partner and discover my life purpose, which is their way of saying, this is what I require to experience, have, lose in order to see through, grow and evolve. To which a master says, I honor that. A master who only gives wisdom in response to a specific question asked. And if you are overflowing with wisdom and dispense it before a question is asked, it is a telltale sign that the wisdom that we have gathered has only made us more hungry and insatiable. Where the only resolve for a hungry mind is merging back into union with its beloved loving heart. The spiritual ego is quick to correct. It connects through enmeshment. It relates through codependency. And it only helps by rescuing. Please do not confuse it with loving wisdom. It is simply the next location for your love to be sent. 
So to help you remove your familial mask or the role you played in your family, who you must be to make sure others around are approving of you, to remove the societal mask, who you must be in order to be more appealing versus appalling to the world in view. And now, the love helps you remove the mask of spiritual identity, who you think you must be to be more approved, to be more accepted versus rejected, whether in a spiritual community, in online chat groups, or just the way you lead with yourself when interacting with strangers. A spiritual identity that when others are not speaking the same new age verbiage leads you to believe you're not with someone of like mind. And because you live in your own parallel dimension, there's only one like mind you're gonna find. And it's the peace you make with your own. For in the new era of authenticity, we don't need to find people of like mind. We need to honor a reality of one mind, expressing itself uniquely as each individual coming and going in space and time. We don't need to find others of like mind or to find common ground. Similarity is just how a frightened, fragile ego tries to feel safe to be open around others. Oneness is not sameness. Oneness is not asking us to think, speak, and act the same because we all are various unique frequencies of embodied loving wisdom. Now, oneness is discovered more in realizing how different we all are. And the more different you are from others, the less you actually know about them. And the less you actually know about them, the more interested you are in understanding before you are understood. The less you know about someone, the less you project onto them the wisdom before a question has been asked. For you only know the files within you that someone else requires because of the question they ask that tells you the space they have available. Only loving wisdom can do this. And yet the spiritual ego works day and night to impersonate, to practice, and perfect this. Only exhausting its own energy so to unravel and relinquish its defense mechanisms with no other option but to come out of hiding and to face what it thinks is a death, which is really the destiny of its rebirth into light, which integrates into you. Loving wisdom isn't trying to get away from an ego. Loving wisdom is the masterful force integrating the ego. For just as time and gravity get to be a component in the play of life, the ego has a purpose in evolution. To integrate into becoming a servant of the consciousness within you. So to manifest the embodiment of loving wisdom through the uniqueness and beauty of your personality. And through loving wisdom, we don't just lump ego into one category of unconsciousness. Life is more sophisticated than that. Loving wisdom understands the difference between having an ego and being an ego. 
being an ego means someone's defense mechanisms have triggered a trauma response, whether they know it or not. And it is causing their behavior to drift further away from the embodiment of loving wisdom. Having an ego is just a way of orienting yourself into fully committing and being present in your human experience. So not to make the transpersonal reality an escape from personal circumstances when personal circumstances are the landscape and backdrop through which transpersonal reality or a transcendent spiritual reality enters this world and transforms it for the well-being of all. There's nothing wrong with having an ego. And the more at peace you are with your ego, the more loving you will treat it. And the more loving you will treat it, the kinder it will be to you. And the more responsive it can be to others instead of reactive. And even when someone is being an ego, loving wisdom is more likely to see someone in pain and to discern intelligently between what can I do for this person, even when the best thing I can do is give them the space from me so not to be a distraction from the time they need to be with themselves. And even when someone needs to be with themselves, but being with themselves represents the aloneness, the loneliness and the rejection they haven't processed from their past, loving wisdom hears that plea, but does not overgive or cower to codependent demands. And even when in the presence of someone who gives you an ultimatum and says, if you leave, that's it. With love in our hearts, with courage in our bones, I guess that's it. Remember, every person's words describes the prescription of the journey they are intending. Just like the person on the plane that hypothetically said, I cannot be happy and free until I have abundance, my partner, and my purpose. Someone else says, if you take space to nourish yourself and give me what I really need, that I can't bear to give myself because of the story I tell myself, that's it for us. Okay. That's how it works in their timeline. But it may not be how it works in yours. And the real question you may ask yourself is how much space do I have to hold for my own vulnerabilities? How much kind, loving space do I have to hold for my own concerns, inferiorities? In order to allow the embodiment of loving wisdom to manifest and transform your reality into the highest understanding of light that you are.
because you'll never be more ready than you are right now. If you've been waiting for a sign from the universe, let this be it. There will be pain, there will be discomfort, there will be frustration, confusion. Just like there will be joy and happiness, fulfillment and elation. You will find fulfillment whether or not it plays out the way you envision or need it to be. There will be wholeness, but it may come about by a plan that doesn't match the one you've crafted or created. This is not the path you're entering, it's the path you've always been on. And these words and transmission is provided to you because you are now ready. For the deeper aspects of your path. One where the highest understanding of embodying light is only true in our new era of authenticity. When the love of your heart frees your wise mind of insatiable hunger, all the wisdom of your mind provides strength and focus to your loving heart to free it of the inferiority, doubt, and insecurity it feels. And as wise mind is purged of hunger, as loving heart is absolved of doubt and despair, Both meet right now in the midpoint, the intersection of reality known as you. To manifest the loving wisdom that only when loving and wise will it ever be true. Just feel. We can call this process surrender, but that often just gives the ego something else to do, doesn't it? You know when the ego is trying to surrender because it comes with a thought of, I surrendered, how come nothing happened? Because <laughs> surrender is not a doing, it's an undoing. It's an undoing of the one trying to do it all correctly with an agenda of if I did it correctly, I get what I want. 
there's a word for that in spirituality. It's really a Sanskrit word, a sacred holy Sanskrit word for that. What is that word? Ah, bullshit. No more. No more are we going to manipulate our lives as if twisting yourself in knots, saying things to yourself all day, and trying to hold a certain emotional state is going to impress the universe enough to give you more treats. That's ego land. We take that mask off and we set it aside. We say, thank you. Thank you for the time and effort you provided me to see through my bullshit. But I'm ready for the maturity of loving wisdom. And now, instead of that, your choices can be used to decide how loving and wise you will be in the presence of others. So you can be fulfilled by the vibration of your conduct and the frequency of your integrity. Not by the things you collect that you're only going to discard at a later date. Welcome to the era of authenticity. Welcome to the vibration of loving wisdom. Where the highest understanding could only be the light known as you.